the public chipping in loads and loads of money. And you have the private walking away with the profits at the end of the day. So it becomes basically another system that's rigged for the rich to shield themselves from risk and put all that risk or a great load of it on the backs of the public. Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. My name is David Delk and I'm your host. Today our guest is Jules Boykoff. Jules is an associate professor of political science at Pacific University in Forest Grove and a visiting scholar at the University of Brighton's Chelsea School of Sport in the UK. He is the author of Activism and the Olympics, Dissent at the Games in Vancouver and London, uh, which is forthcoming, and Celebration Capitalism and the Olympic Games, which is also forthcoming. Uh, he is also author of Beyond Bullets, The Suppression of Dissent in the United States, um, and his writings on the Olympics has appeared recently in Counterpunch, The Guardian, The Nation, New Left Review, New York Times, Red Pepper, and elsewhere. He played on the U.S. Olympic soccer team in international competition, um, what, 10, 15 years ago? Uh, a little more than that. But right, right. Well, welcome to the show. Thank you. Right, yeah. And of course, you've been here before. I have. Thanks. Right. It's good to be back. Right, good, yeah. So you went to London, you went to Europe um, for the Olympic Games, and you actually went some time prior to that because you were doing some studying mm -hmm. uh, on the whole Olympic uh, phenomenon. That's right. right. Yeah, I had the good fortune of spending three months in Spain doing research on the 1992 Barcelona Olympics, which is seen by many as a very successful Olympics. It's known as the Barcelona model. And so I was working at the Autonomous University of Barcelona there, and there were certain documents that I could only get in Spanish, so that's why I wanted to spend some time there, and that was great. And then after that, we went over to the University of Brighton, which you mentioned, where I was a visiting scholar. And I was there for five months, including a few weeks in London, where I stayed in London for the actual Olympics themselves. So yes, eight months away and all doing research on this Olympic juggernaut. Great, good, good. So uh, you, wh while you were there, you, you wrote an article in the New York Times, or an op-ed in the New York Times, and you wrote, while, while Europe ro rolls in economic turmoil, London is preparing for a lavish jubilee of international goodwill. In a few weeks, the city will host the 2012 Summer Olympics. But behind the spectacle of, of athletic prowess and global harmony, brass knuckle politics and brute, brute economics reign. Explain. Sure. Well, I mean, I think a lot of us, when we think of the Olympics, we think of happy faces, smiling athletes, extraordinary athletics. And while all th three of those things are, are absolutely true about the Olympics, there is a little bit of a hidden history with the games as well. As you say, behind the scenes, brute politics and economics rule. And what we really focused on in that piece for the New York Times, I should say my co-author was Alan Tomlinson from the University of Brighton. So what we focused on was the role of the International Olympic Committee, or the IOC. And the IOC has a fascinating history. I mean, it's always been a sort of privileged sliver of the global 1%. It has been, for a long time, dukes, barons, lords, and this sort of thing. So literal aristocracy running the IOC in the early days. They eventually opened it up to include wealthy business people, mostly wealthy businessmen. In fact, it wasn't until 1981, 81, that women were allowed to participate as members of the IOC. So right now it's a, a group of 105 people who run the International Olympic Committee, and they have tremendous power. And we focused, about, we focused on the kind of power that they wield when it comes to the Olympics. For example, they can squeeze loads of money out of the host city to host the games. And this is what has happened in, happened in London. It's what happened in Vancouver for the 2010 Winter Olympics, and on and on. It's happening right now in Sochi as Russia prepares for 2014, and Rio as they prepare for the 2016 Summer Olympics. So there's a real strong economic wrangling that's happening from the IOC, but also a political wrangling where they basically can get host cities to change the law of the land, to bring them into accordance with IOC principles. So maybe a couple examples of that. Uh, what happened in Vancouver was Vancouver City Council passed an ordinance. It was called the Sign Bylaw, which basically made it illegal for you to hang in your house or place of business a sign that was not celebratory of the Olympics. So if you put a sign up that said, I don't really think the Olympics are all that great, the police could notify you, and if you didn't take down the sign within 24 hours, they would come in and take it down for you, even if it was your privately owned home. 
In London, mm -hmm. they had something called the 2006 Olympics and Paralympic Games Act that really cracked down on whether you could use particular terms in specific order. What I mean is you couldn't say like London 2012 and bronze medal in a sentence if you were trying to make any kind of money. You, they had incredible amounts of strictures on how you could use the words summer, Olympics, even just 2012. And it was a violation of, of law, British law, thanks mm -hmm. to this law. You could face a 20,000 pound fine, so in the neighborhood of $35,000 for violating this. And the effect was that people who had local businesses who wanted to sort of use the Olympics to get people excited about their business were essentially unable to do so. So a specific example was there was a cafe that had the Flaming Torch Olympic baguette on their menu. They were told by the Olympic Delivery Authority that they needed to reconsider that menu item or possibly face a 20,000 pound fine. And so what we argued in that piece that you mentioned in the New York Times is it all goes back to the power of the International Olympic Committee. They wield an inordinate amount of influence when they roll in and touch down on a particular city. And we think that's just too much. And so while we totally support the exciting athletics, and I, I was a big fan of, of a lot of what I saw on the track and around the, the, in the velodrome, in the swimming pool, all that stuff, on the soccer pitch for sure. Um, while we love all that, there's this other side that really we should probably slow down and reconsider, especially because the privilege that the IOC drips is indicative of the way our society is set up in the bigger picture. And really, how, and what I'm arguing is it helps us understand a sort of special form of capitalism that is really kind of detrimental to the way our society operates. And in fact, um, really exacerbates the inequalities that we see in our society. And is that, is that what you're calling uh, celebration capitalism? That's exactly right. So celebration capitalism is uh, similar to but different from what Naomi Klein argues in her book, The Shock Doctrine, The Rise of Disaster Capitalism. She says that you have a state of exception that allows the sort of co corporate captains to come in and say, look, state of exception, we're in a, an extreme crisis, it's a disaster, as she talks about it. Therefore, you have to put fat dollops of neoliberal capitalism onto your public plate, by which she means privatization, deregulation, letting the market decide, and that sort of thing. And while I think she's right about that in many instances, what I'm arguing in, in this book that you mentioned is that there's also something called celebration capitalism that originates just like she talks about from a state of exception, but rather than a perilous one, a disaster like she talks about, it's a celebration. The Olympics are sort of a quintessential example of a social celebration, and yet it's a state of exception where normal rules don't apply. But instead of getting fat dollops of neoliberal capitalism, what instead we get are so-called public-private partnerships. And these public-private partnerships are lopsided in favor of the private. So we have the public chipping in loads and loads of money. And you have the private walking away with the profits at the end of the day. So it becomes basically another system that's rigged for the rich to shield themselves from risk and put all that risk, or a great load of it, on the backs of the public. So in London, the public paid for between 88 and 98 percent of the Olympics. 88 and 98 percent. And yet who walks away with the profits? If we're to believe Moody's, the investor service who put out a report, it's what they called the corporates. They're the ones who are going to benefit. In particular of the corporates, it's the corporate sponsors of the Olympics who are going to benefit from the games. So it's a massive subsidy that taxpaying Britainers were providing to these private companies to come in and make loads of money. Mm -hmm. so, so uh, Republicans in the current election have complained about Obama redistrib or wanting to redistribute wealth, but this is an example of a redistribution of wealth from uh, ordinary Londoners or mm -hmm. ordinary English people uh, to corporations. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's trickle-up economics, I guess, would be another way of thinking about celebration capitalism. The wealth s starts with us and trickles up toward those who happen to run, own, or manage corporations. Mm -hmm. And some of these corporations that were in London are some of the worst of the corporate worst. I mean, you have got Dow Chemical, which was a sponsor of the games. Uh, they spent in the, in the neighborhood of $100 million to become sponsors of the London and Vancouver Olympics. And they also provided a seven million pound decorative wrap, so more than $10 million decorative wrap for the Olympic Stadium. 
Uh, Dow Chemical, of course, is responsible in part because they bought Union Carbide in 1999. Union Carbide was responsible for the awful gas disaster in Bhopal, India in 1984, killing more than 20,000 people. Uh, you can look down the line at Coca-Cola and all the things that they do to take water out of the earth and use it to make Coca-Cola and not to mention their labor conditions. They're one of the big sponsors of the Olympics. McDonald's, same thing. Not exactly pushing health food, not exactly elite athlete food, but there you have it. They're one of the biggest sponsors of the game. They produce, mm -hmm. the, they make the biggest McDonald's in the world in London 2012. It was mammoth. This huge McDonald's gets plunked down. Now it's gone. But uh, so some of these sponsors, they're, they're not exactly who you might think of as, as your responsible citizens of the corporate world. I mean, I could keep going all day long for the show. BP for example, was a sustainability sponsor of the Olympics. I mean, it's hard to make this stuff up. <laughs> BP, a sustainability mm -hmm. sponsor, is just amazing, really. In fact, they started in London a new thing called the Sustainability Partners. BP was on the list. Uh, EDF Energy, which is a European-based firm that's pushing nuclear power. Again, nuclear power as a sort mm -hmm. of sustainability thing. Quite questionable, I think, on many levels. So. Uh, it's these these corporations that roll in and have these sponsorships and that are actually it's very questionable as to the merits of what they're arguing mm -hmm. but they're the ones who benefit from the Olympic Games right, yeah so I, I would assume uh, if this was happening in the United States there would be an outcry and protest and so forth and I assume that that was the case in London also it's true. I mean, it's con it's, there, there was a, a big outpouring of dissent, primarily rolling through a group called the Counter Olympics Network. And they work very hard to organize protests and, and really have a voice out there putting forth alternatives to the Olympics as we understand it. Most people understand it as this happy face, smiley faced athletic competition only. Uh, and yes, I would hope that if it were in the United States that we would have some activism around it as well. But it's tricky because the Olympics are immensely popular and a lot of people watch the Olympics. So as an activist, it's actually kind of a complex topic to take on. And I interviewed in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 on the ground grassroots activists in London. And one question I always asked them was, well, how do you feel about the Olympics? How do you feel about sports? And down to the last one, every single one of the people I interviewed liked sports. They even liked the Olympics. Mm -hmm. They just didn't like the way it was being carried out by these corporations as sponsors and taking public money and funneling them basically to the rich. So it makes for a complex thing to try to fight against because you're not exactly anti-Olympics per se, but you're anti the way the Olympics are being carried out. And, and that can be a really difficult message to convey through the media to the general public. It's quite a challenge. Mm -hmm. And how how did the media there did, did the media just um, ignore it, or, or did they uh, respond with repeating some of the critiques? Or mm -hmm. well, I would in the run up to the games, in the months before the games, I, I've done a, now a systematic analysis of the media coverage from June first through when the Olympics began on July twenty seventh, and all the way through two weeks past the end of the games, basically the end of August. And what what I found was in the early days. Even the mainstream media, even right-wing media in England, like the Daily Mail, for example, were very critical of the way the Olympics were being carried out. The right-wing media in the UK tended to focus on the costs of the games and how it was just a fiscal debacle, whereas the left of center outlets like The Guardian and The Independent were probably more concerned with civil liberties issues and the militarization of the public sphere. But nevertheless, you had this groundswell of dissent emerging in mainstream media outlets that really opened up a space for activists to walk into with their critiques when it came time for the games. And so while I think if you talk to activists, they wouldn't be happy with the amount of coverage that they got. I mean, we usually never are necessarily. But in the analysis that I've done of the activists in London, more than half of the accounts of protest events around the Olympic Games, more than half put forth a frame of what I'm calling the principled grievance frame by which I mean the activists were portrayed as having a legitimate grievance that they were putting on the table, and that grievance wasn't immediately dismissed by the journalist or undercut as stupid, freaky, or otherwise unwise. And so 
that's pretty amazing when you think about mm -hmm. it. I've done a lot of research on, on activism and, and the media. We've talked about it on the show before. Mm -hmm. And the numbers that I'm seeing from my analysis of London are strikingly divergent from the kind of things we talked about before, like whether we were talking about activists in Seattle, whether we were talking in 1999, whether we were talking about activists in Washington, D.C. in 2000 around the IMF and World Bank, whether we were talking about Occupy movements as we did last time in the show. So yeah, the, the media coverage was actually quite propitious if you will, for activists during this time frame. Oh, wonderful. Great. Uh, so you mentioned the militarization of public spaces. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. Sure. It was amazing what London officials did. They actually ratcheted missiles and missile launchers onto the top of people's apartment complexes. So Starstreak and Rapier surface-to-air missiles were plunked down on top of where people actually lived. How did the people who lived there learn about the fact that these missiles were being plopped on their roofs? They got a little uh, sheet under their door, a little brochure that said, oh, by the way, we're putting <laughs> missiles, surface-to-air <laughs> missiles on the roof, right? Yes, you may be a target. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, to be fair to to uh, the London officials, I mean, we have to put this in the context of the fact that in 1972 at Munich, there was a, an attack carried out by Black September where Israeli athletes and coaches were killed, and it really changed uh, the way the games have played out in terms of security. So host cities don't take any chances anymore, and that's why they would put do, put this uh, these missiles on the roof. But like you say, is this making these people a target now? Are they a new target? That's what they were asking, exactly mm -hmm. kind of what you're getting at there. Are, by putting the missiles on our roofs, are, are you making us a target? I mean, this was just the beginning, though. I mean, you had, low, you had more than 18,000 people from the British military who rolled in to patrol the games at venues, 18,000 plus which just gives a visual militarization of what was happening. Also at the time, um, the LOCOG, which is the London Organizing Committee for the Olympic Games, had hired out a private security firm called G4S to provide more than 10,000 security guards. Well, guess what? The privatization of security didn't work out. The G4S flopped on their face and weren't able to provide the appropriate number, the promised number of security guards. And so the military literally had to be called in. And so that's how they got to that 18,000 wow. number. So you've got that. You've got armed guards on the tube. You've got uh, the biggest Navy warship that's anchored along the Thames River. It you, you goes on and on. So you saw a, a very intense militarization, all in the name of stopping terrorism. Now, nobody, of course, wants to see terrorism. But what happens then, if there are no terrorists to be found, who gets the brunt of that kind of intimidation? Well, it's the activists. And so that's really what we saw in London, this really heavy-handed uh, clap down, crank down on the activists when they engaged in what was, you know, in some ways very mild, humor-oriented dissent, not meant to be criminal in any kind of way. One example of that was the week before the Olympics, there was a group called Greenwash Gold. They had this terrific online campaign where you could vote for who earned the greenwash gold, like who was putting forth ideas of green, but it was utterly fake. It was between BP, uh, Rio Tinto, and Dow were the three that you could vote for. Well, it turns out Rio Tinto won the gold. They had this mock award ceremony at Trafalgar Square where to talk about it being a green wash, they poured green custard on top of the people as they stood at the metal stand. Boom, police come in, crack down, arrest seven people um, for criminal sus or suspicion of criminal damage. And you know, seven, it's just like it's wow. a mock award ceremony. It's mm -hmm. humor. In fact, they had already wiped up all the custard. There wasn't a trace of it left in the square. And so you see this crackdown there. You and so what I guess what? I'm suggesting is that you have police. They've gotten all these toys. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity to sort of jack up your uh, Kevlar per capita quotient, and they take advantage of that. And then they use it, but they use it toward dissidents, um, people putting forth legitimate grievances in the public sphere rather than the terrorists who thankfully didn't eventuate there. Right, yeah, and so what kind of charges did they, did they file against these uh, activists? In the case of the Custard 7, it was mm -hmm. suspicion of criminal damage. What's interesting what about- What would the damage be? Damage to the public square is what they were alleging, yeah, with the green <laughs> <For> custard. custard. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, 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 it's literally <laughs> laughable, isn't it? But what's interesting about both the Custard 7 case and also the uh, week later, there was a big critical mass bike ride where 182 people were arrested. And what's interesting in both cases is the activists were arrested and they were put on bail, but they were not charged with anything. And the bail conditions 
were extremely restrictive. So for example, and I saw some of the bail conditions, activists shared with me what the conditions were of their bail. And some, most of them had the condition that they were not allowed to go in or around Olympic venues. So if you had a ticket to go watch soccer, football as they call it, for example, uh, you couldn't go hmm. because that was one of your bail conditions. And guess what? The bail conditions extended to after the Paralympic Games concluded. They ended, if I remember correctly, on September 17th, so after the Paralympics. So basically what you do is you take some of the most uh, aggressive and interested activists who are willing to put their bodies in the line, you arrest them on sort of odd charges, suspicion of criminal damage in the case of the Custard 7, and you give them these extensive bail conditions that take them off the streets for the duration of the games. And that's basically how the London police, the Metropolitan Scotland Yard, that's how they basically dealt with protest, preemptive arrests of people that might come back later. Hmm. Okay. The, uh, in, your, in your writing that I, that I read, you, you said that the police there had identified four categories of, of, um, of possible threats. That's right. What sure. were the four categories? They were, they were terrorism, they were protest, this is in order, uh, there was criminal behavior, like crime bosses moving in, like organized crime, and the fourth was natural disasters. I mean, he publicly, Chris Allison, the head of Olympic security from, the, from Scotland Yard, publicly put it in that order, putting together terrorism, activism, uh, and organized crime, and uh, natural disasters as being the four biggest threats to the game. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that very much put it on the table where, where the Met stood on dissent. Now, of course, they came out later and gave this incredibly paternalistic sheen onto the, what their approach was. They said, uh, we encourage people, of course, you, you're welcome to protest. Just talk to us ahead of time so we can make sure that you're doing it in as safe a way as possible. <laughs> so an extremely sort of paternalistic, preemptive approach. Mm -hmm. What basically they're now calling total policing in the UK. After the um, riots that happened about a year before the Olympics in Tottenham and other areas of London, the police had to respond and do something, and they came out with this v uh, sort of vapid, I would argue, certainly vague notion of total policing, which in the form of London took to basically took the form of uh, preemptive policing and heavy paternalism against activists. Okay. Did the security forces there go on a spending spree, buying, you know, just ramping up their uh, resources? Well, that is the general trend with the Olympics, is that security forces see it as a once in a generation, if not once in a lifetime opportunity to get all of the toys and weapons that they wanted, uh, but could never get under normal times. So take the example of uh, Vancouver, Canada for the 2010 Winter Games, where they bought themselves a medium range acoustic device. Medium range acou acoustic devices are used in war zones like Iraq. To, and it basically looks like a little satellite dish. You can look on YouTube and you can see how it works. There's a nice video and you basically just put it on people and the waves hit them and it's ear piercing kind of sound that comes out of these things, acoustic devices. So they would have never been able to buy that for normal political or for normal policing. But in this sort of political moment of exception, they were able to get that. London, similarly, BBC reported that the authorities in, in London were able to get themselves a long-range acoustic device. A medium-range acoustic device wasn't enough for them, apparently, so they got a long-range acoustic device. And similarly, they would have never been able to get this in normal political times. So yes, the security forces do use the Olympics as this incredible opportunity to get things that they've always wanted. Scotland Yard got 10,000 more plastic bullets just to get ready for London. I mean, they're just like, hey, mm. store up, you know, take our storerooms and stock them up real good. This is sort of a rare opportunity to, to get what we want. Okay, right. So kind of was the same way the United States ha can conducts wars in order to both get rid of surplus military equipment and to test out new equipment. The Olympics are kind of uh, used the same way by domestic police forces? Well, I mean, the, the fact that they do use sort of more experimental weapons is scary. And I think if you framed it like that to the general public, the general public would be quite alarmed uh, by that mm -hmm. way of thinking about it. And yeah, I mean, it's like big experiments that they're supposedly carrying out in the name of security that can affect everyday citizens. I mean, one interesting thing, I think, an important thing about what happened with the medium range acoustic device in Vancouver mm -hmm. was that there was an incredible groundswell of 
dissent that challenged the use of, and even just having, a medium range acoustic device. So you had civil libertarians coming from the British Columbia Civil Liberties Association teaming up with black, black bloc anarchists who came together that said, you know, we don't want this thing on the streets either. We're going to protest as well. And so you had groups of people coming from all different areas of the city to protest this. And guess what? They were actually successful in getting the Vancouver authorities to promise to keep the thing in the box, basically. They disabled the weapons function on the medium range acoustic device, essentially making it into sort of a glorified bullhorn that they mm. could use to, for crowd control. So I mean, while we have all these pressures we've been talking about all show and how it gives particular advantages to those who already have power, there have been really important moments in the history of the Olympics where there's been grassroots fight back from people and have been actually quite successful in defending some of the principles that they hold. Okay, all right, very good. Do you have a closing statement? And we got three minutes. Well, I mean, I guess I would just say that I think with the Olympics, it, it is a really complex thing to protest. And I would just want to make it clear that I really do appreciate the Olympics. You mentioned at the outset that I had the good fortune of representing the U.S. Olympic team in international competition, and I, I'm really grateful for that opportunity of being able to do that. When I write about and talk about with you the Olympics, you know, in a lot of ways, I, I want the Olympics to be the best thing it can be. If you read the Olympic Charter, there's a whole lot to like about what the, the way that IOC sets up the ideas in principle. In principle, they're pushing towards sustainability, and they've been big in sustainability and being more ecologically conscience, conscious. And I think I see that as a very positive development. And I think when there's critics like myself uh, and others, many others, what we're trying to do is push the Olympics to live up to the standards that they say that they uh, believe in. And unfortunately, at this point, the International Olympic Committee ha just hasn't lived up to those standards. We can hope that they do, and we can push them to try to do it, but they just haven't done so so far. The games are not ecologically viable. They destroy environments when, when they move in. They displace many people in China, Beijing, 1.5 million. These kind of are, were displaced by the Olympic juggernaut. Mm -hmm. So I mean, these are the kind of practices we want to move away from. And so that's where I'm coming from when I critique the Olympics. It's, it's an appreciation of the sport and a desire for the Olympics to be as good as they can be. Great. Thank you very much for being here. All right, thank you. Good, good. So we've been talking with Jules Boykoff, who's a political science professor at Pacific University in Forest Grove about the Olympics. If you want to follow Jules, you can do so on uh, Twitter, a, a, a hash mark Jules Boykoff. Uh, you can also see more of Jules uh, on, uh, on the interview he did with Amy Goodman on Democracy Now! And we created a, a, a tiny URL for that, so the URL is HTTP uh, backslash or is it forward slash hmm. slash slash tinyurl.com backslash boykoff2012 and uh, if you watch that he comes on about 14 minutes into the into the story the mission of the alliance for democracy is to end corporate domination establish true democracy and create a just society based on sustainable equitable economy learn more visit our national website at thealliancefordemocracy.org or Portland website at afd-pdx.org. Thanks to our crew today, Roger Bates, Dave King, Janet Morris, Lori Sutton, and Tom Thomas. And thanks to you, our audience, for watching. We'll see you again next week. Bye. <laughs>